lot of people were helped. A lot of freedom was given. A lot of terrorists were killed. So I would not, I'm not on the side that it, it was a, an entire mistake. We left them here. They had weapons. They had these military vehicles. They had all this, you know, and it's just like, they just folded and ran. America has a unique challenge understanding conflict. Most of us have the privilege of being thousands of miles away from the war America's fighting. Unfortunately, the result of that distance is often apathy or ignorance. We saw it in the first few years of World War II. We saw it after the 1990s terrorist attacks on U.S. embassies globally. And now we're seeing it again in the war in the Ukraine. Until Americans are directly impacted, the shelf life of each new global crisis has just a few weeks before we lose interest and move on to something else. Today, the war in Afghanistan is a distant memory. To the newest generation of college students, it's just a footnote in their textbooks, some faraway exotic land like Vietnam or Pearl Harbor. When I deployed to Afghanistan in 2019, I didn't expect to be sitting in a college classroom a month after I got home. A year later, as we watched the Afghan government crumble on CNN, several classmates approached me to ask what was happening and explain it to them. I was never really sure what to tell them. I didn't have a good answer either. I didn't know what was going on entirely beyond the news. All I had was one deployment to reference in a 20-year war. Most of what I know about Afghanistan was secondhand knowledge from other people. Training from scenarios I never saw, or lessons learned from battles I never fought. That's what this project is. It's just an attempt at an answer. Now, I can't give you a full analysis on the war. It's just too complex to break down in a short video, but I can give you a brief history and some perspectives of people who have been there. And maybe together we can just walk away with a little bit better understanding of a war that shaped multiple American generations. Afghanistan is often referred to as the graveyard of empires, and its history lives up to the name. Its varied geography includes harsh mountain ranges and austere deserts, paired with a deeply rooted culture of tribalism. Throughout antiquity, Afghanistan traded hands from Darius I of Babylon, Alexander the Great, Mahmud of Ghazni, and Genghis Khan. But the British Empire's colonization in the 19th century was the origin of Afghanistan's modern insurgencies. In 1921, Afghanistan becomes an independent nation, setting in motion a series of monarchs, social reforms, and alignment with the USSR. However, coups and infighting in the late 1970s results in a new anti-Soviet guerrilla movement, the Mujahideen. On December 24, 1979, the USSR invaded Afghanistan to help its failing Afghan communist regime. By 1980, the Mujahideen had united against the Soviets and Soviet-backed Afghan National Army. Throughout the 80s, the Soviets held urban areas and the Mujahideen the rural. Weapon shipments from the US, China, and Britain poured in to help the rebels combat communism. By 1992, the Mujahideen stormed the capital Kabul, forming a fractured Islamic state in place of the communist government. The popular new Taliban movement, riding on promises of peace and prosperity, take control, instituting radical Sharia law overnight and cracking down on social reforms. 
Taliban were also sheltering a new group named Al Qaeda, led by a young, well connected Saudi Arabian man named Osama bin Laden. Within months of setting up shop, Al Qaeda would launch a devastating attack on the US that would change war and the globe forever. Good afternoon. On my orders, the United States military has begun strikes against Al Qaeda terrorist training camps and military installations of the Taliban regime in Afghanistan. These carefully targeted actions are designed to disrupt the use of Afghanistan as a terrorist base of operations and to attack the military capability of the Taliban regime. Now armed with the assistance of U.S. air and special operations support, the Northern Alliance quickly crushed the Taliban. Most notably, Operation Anaconda, the first major U.S. offensive in the war, became a textbook victory through the combined use of air, conventional, and special operations forces. By 2002, the Taliban were fleeing to neighboring nations, leaving room for a shaky Afghan democracy to sprout. With the Taliban on the run, President Bush announced the end of all major combat operations in Afghanistan. And with the invasion of Iraq looming in 2003, troops and media attention quickly left the country. Afghanistan fell back into obscurity for another few years before the Taliban would reemerge in 2006 in a violent way. There's enemy infiltrating from Pakistan. Al Qaeda and the Taliban have regrouped. The situation in Afghanistan is more dire than we've seen publicly portrayed. From inside this secretive land, these guys have shown they are not going to quit. Frontline investigates the return of the Taliban. For the next 15 years, Afghanistan would see an ebb and flow in the intensity of combat, depending on the administration or commander leading the war effort. But we have to remember how broad this summary is. Each person's experience could be vastly different depending on when, where, and who they deployed with. We can never get a full picture of the war in Afghanistan because it's too complex. But we can piece together individual perspectives to at least get an idea, an understanding of what went on in those years. This nation stands with the good people of New York City and New Jersey and Connecticut as we mourn the loss of thousands of our citizens. I can hear you! After the Taliban's resurgence in 2005, the U.S. military mission was primarily direct combat operations. However, as the years went on, more focus was put into installing Afghan-led infrastructure, allowing the U.S. to eventually leave behind a stable allied government. In 2014, President Obama declared an end to the U.S. combat mission, leaving only a few thousand troops as advisors during the transition. It would be another seven years before the last troops left Kabul. The difficulties of the war weren't a secret. They were in the headlines constantly. Corruption, mismanagement of forces and funds, conflicting directives, civilians being killed. But what did that reality actually look like on the ground? To find out, I talked to three former U.S. special operators with deployment experience in Afghanistan from 2009 to 2020. I know you guys deployed pretty early on in the war. What was your first deployment to Afghanistan like versus your last one in 2020? So in 2009, when I worked with the, I was an MP and I worked with the Afghan National Police, uh, AMP, for the most part, we, we were training those guys up and we were taking them on mission. And at that point in time, what I would say is they actually had a will to fight. 
I remember a lot of people asking why US troops kept dying after President Obama announced the end of combat operations in 2014. How would you explain to somebody who doesn't know uh, how the military escalates and de-escalates its involvement in conflicts? You really have to understand the levels of warfare, right? It being the strategic, operational, and tactical. Strategic being the policymakers, um, high military officials making decisions, operational being or the theater, being like uh, operations uh, campaigns that happen within the theater, and then tactical is really where we operate at. What Dave's talking about here is essentially the three tiers of any military operation. You have the tactical level where most of the military falls. This is anything from fixing jets to going on a patrol. You have the operational level, which is where your mid and upper grade leaders lie, and they control the actions of the tactical units below them. Then finally, you have your strategic leaders, which is just a tiny portion of the military that handle the big picture operations. Really, I would say what changed 12 years later, if you look at the strategic operational tactical level was, we weren't going out to the Taliban and fighting them where they were at or seeking them out. There were probably some units going out and doing some things, um, but not many. There was not many. Really what we were doing at that point in time was uh, advising, assisting, um, and then pretty much coaching. At that pretty much means, hey, we're coaching you. We're going to help you with aircraft. And that's it. To compare to before, I was advised to assist a company and I'm down there with you. Pretty much I'm leading you. I'm telling you what you did right, you did wrong, and I'm training you. So like what really changed was at the tactical and operational um, levels, I'd say. So on that, you know, nation building gets thrown around a lot talking about Iraq and Afghanistan. You know, basically the U.S. toppling a bad guy or a regime uh, that's a danger to us and instilling a good guy and someone who could be an ally basically making kind of a Middle Eastern America. You know, what went wrong with that concept here in Afghanistan? If you don't know anything about nation building, it's incredibly hard to do. You're essentially building, it is what it, what it says in the title, is nation building. You're building an entire nation. We have done that unsuccessfully a counter time. I don't even really know how many times we've done that unsuccessfully, right? It's just really hard to build a nation, right, as a whole. So President Bush, he ended up dragging his feet on it for years and years and years. We overthrew the Taliban in 2000, uh, 2001. By 2005, we, did not, we still did not have a standing army in Afghanistan. So four years later, we didn't have a standing army. So then like by 2006, when the Taliban's coming back with Al Qaeda, it's like, well, who's, who's to defend them? Because one thing that we really did with Afghanistan back in the beginning is like we went from tribalism, which is what they, they know, and we try to make them, you know, a republic, a democracy. We try to make them just like this, like a, uh, a unipolar power like us. And they, you know, it, there needs to be some pluralism there. It can't be just like, it can't be America. It, we try to make that. And at the end, it fell out. It went back to the way that it is. Pete, how about you? How did your deployment in 2020 feel different than the ones you had before? It felt like 90% of the province we were in was controlled by the Taliban. It doesn't feel like that was spoken about very openly, but that's, that's the feeling I got while we were there. That's as far as like bringing in food and supplies for our guys, uh, not American side, because we got air supplied a lot of a lot of items that wasn't an issue but bringing in stuff for our afghans it, it was almost like you had to know a guy who knew a guy who knew a guy to smuggle stuff through checkpoints and the secret routes so it wasn't like it was controlled by very much by the afghan government at all how about you guys as afghans who were working with how were they performing during that time i got facetime with multiple afghans every day uh, so i got a feel for the sentiment on the ground and it, it was um it's kind of strange to watch it happen because a lot of these guys they had cousins and and they, they wouldn't outright tell you this but their friend of a friend would tell you and it would get around they had cousins family friends in the taliban and, and it was kind of like you, you know pick you know pick who you're going to go with you know while the americans are here what motivated those guys to keep fighting for us, even after the U.S. announced that we'd be leaving pretty soon? We're really motivated by the prospect of becoming an American citizen. And that's, that's what they were, they were working so hard in Afghanistan for. Guys that were blew up multiple times, shot, 
a lot. Um, Afghans that have done more for America than you know a lot of Americans have done <laughs> because they wanted they believed in what America is about. But but I didn't meet a lot of guys who were uh, convicted about making Afghanistan America. The majority of the guys that were that were our, our best go getters were were trying to make it over here. So besides going to America, what were some of the other motivators you saw that made the Afghans keep fighting? Yeah, you had your hard, hardcore convictions about wanting to go to America, which was the most that I encountered. And you had your convictions of trying to make Afghanistan more free. And you had your guys who were just going with the wind. It was easiest to go with us, so they were going with us. And you had your guys who, hey, you know, obviously I never knew, but were either insiders or just out for themselves, or you could guess who those guys were by their performance, by the way they interacted with you. Um, but, you know, a lot of times you didn't know for sure. It's very convoluted and extremely hard to tell, um, you know, who who was um, who was really down for the calls and who wasn't. Chase, was it the same for you on your deployments with uh, experiences with partner forces? Um, yeah, you know, from my personal experience, it, it was just kind of this, I don't know, I guess from my side, and maybe I, you know, um, I wasn't at, uh, I guess, a higher leadership level to really maybe uh, see it at a deeper level, but it was just kind of like, these are the these are guys we have to take with us because ultimately like we're not trying to invade this country and overtake it but we're trying to uh just in, empower them so that once we eventually leave they can you know conduct you know maintain it um but you know they they fought with us you know when we got into those ticks you know they were they were engaging they were many times the first ones to go into rooms that uh very easily you know were you know fatal funnels you know that uh they could get you know shot up for sure so you know they were putting their necks on the lines and you know thinking back you know every time it's like well i only got another month before i go back home these guys there's they don't go back home this is their home mm. yeah you know on that point talking about leaving every few months you know i think the rotational deployment system that the the u.s uses something that a lot of Americans don't really know about. Uh, can you talk how it can be difficult, either in the military or in your job now, just when someone has to leave every few months in a cross-cultural environment and the kind of stresses that can make? You you know, you get people that come here, they have to get onboarded, they have to get familiarized, you know, um, with the culture and, and other things. And then it, it's a process, right? And finally, you know, after several months or even years, like right when it's like there's a flow, there's good jiving and, you know, working together, harmony. Of course, you know, it's like, well, this is not their home. So they, you know, they go home for whatever family reasons or just, you know, the living environment is just hard to deal with. So, and then it's like, boom, you just lose all of that kind of, um, you know, rapport and uh, experience that, that, had happened so uh, you know how do you balance the you know having the rotational aspect you know so that guys don't get burnt out or you know just you know obviously there's family but at the same time build those relationships that are built just the experience that is that comes with being on the ground after long enough you know how do you balance that and i don't know so besides rotations, you know, the U.S. seemed to tackle Afghanistan a lot like they're fighting a conventional force sometimes rather than an insurgency group. What are some things that you think the military should look at next time for improving if we find ourselves in another counterinsurgency environment? Uh, we're armchair quarterback in this, so you know, it's easy to look back on it and say this is the perfect thing to have done. But, you know, if it was Burger King, I had it my way. Uh, we would have got out. We would have got out right after we um, did the initial operation with those few teams from Fifth Group in, um, and uh, just put the Taliban in their place and got back out. And said, "Look, we'll do it again if you harbor Al Qaeda again." Anything else to add, Dave? 
my my thought, one dude, is that Afghanistan should have stayed a small war. If you're fighting an insurgency, you're fighting a uh, terrorist organization, you're fighting uh, a resistance, right? It is very hard to fight them with conventional troops. It becomes very, very difficult due to the fact this, right? The main thing with the resistance, how to beat them, is there's really been only a couple ways in the entire history how to beat an insurgency, right? And one of them is you essentially have to get them online, get your troops online, and drive them out. Because it's very hard to defeat an insurgency, because really you're killing an ideal. So how do you kill an ideal? And that's that's incredibly difficult, right? If not, the other thing is, is like you have to have the you have to have the support of the populace, right? How do you get the support of the populace when you have 140,000 uh, foreign soldiers occupying the land? It's just going to cause tension and friction as a whole, anyway. Chase, that uh, that tension and that friction with the locals that Dave was talking about. Did you ever see the consequences of that? Those impacts on your deployments in Afghanistan? I, I think you know any insurgency, you know. Uh, warfare or, or uh, you know battle uh, it's just it's it's surgical right it's you're just trying to take out the bad you know while keeping all the good um, and I think you know but when it really comes down to it it's still war so it's like man how do you how do you really do that is that really something that is you could say can be successful or is it just like you have to come to the um, the realization that you know, no matter how precise targeting and uh, good your intel is on you know uh, finding the bad guys, uh, there's going to be like collateral damage. Some of the you know experiences on my deployments where you know we went after the bad guy, but in the process, I think some good people you know they got hurt or they got killed and. Um, you know, how do you explain that now in a way to you know, family, friends, the community that it was an accident, it's not our mission, but you know, those people are now, they're hurt and they only saw what they see is that you know, American coalition forces killed you know, my cousin or brother or something. So now when you were trying to just take out the bad, you, you've just contaminated more. You know, now someone who was on the fence it's like, well, I'm going to take up arms and I'm going to go fight, you know, against these um, infidels or, or whatever. So, yeah, it's like, it's a constant, I think that's, those are constant elements constantly at play. So, uh, and I, I, that's what I saw during my time in Afghanistan a bit. Um, yeah, you do, there is the good that we, we did, but then there's some things that didn't go according to plan, which had an effect overall. Yeah, I don't think people really understand just how much planning and thought actually goes into every op that we do just to prevent bad things from happening. But there's still, you know, that there's always that risk of collateral damage, like you're saying. What would you say to someone who demonizes the military when those things go wrong, those planned things that are unfortunate, but when they happen? War is not designed to be perfect by no means, right? Nor, no, no conflicts gonna be perfect, right? We just, you know, we have to learn from our mistakes. And I think we do a really good job as a, as a military. And, and you know, this is like, how often do we lessons learn? Mm. All the time, yeah. right? What, what do we do right after a mission? We do the after action review, right? Like as a military, there's a reason we are the best military in the world. Technology, education. Chase, do you have anything to add from your time? Like, how is your experience with the U.S. military different than other ones you've worked with? The American military is by far just so unique, and uh, there is uh, just this, you know, honor and nobleism, and um, you know, it's just like you know, to be in the American military is something just that's honorable. And whereas, you know, being living in Iraq now, like you know, just seeing the military here, it's just the corruption just you know there's no intrinsic motivation uh it's just to get a paycheck uh just you know support your family it's just you don't but you don't feel backed you don't you don't feel supported by your government and uh and pete how were your afghans treated differently than uh you would treat your peers or how your chain of command in the u.s treats you guys the majority of them seem pretty pretty about it um I think the problem with them is as you got higher up in the ranks. So like Joe Snuffy in the commandos usually wasn't too much to worry about. But as you got higher up the ranks and these guys had opportunities for corruption and lining their pockets, 
you know, again, in an impoverished country, these things are thought about differently than what we do here. You know, here we, we have, we turn the spigot and we have hot or cold water. We have AC and heating year round. You know, those guys over there are thinking about commodities a lot different than what we do. Um, but the majority of the time it was the higher ups. Uh, one of the first problems we ran into was was officers, uh, accusations of officers uh, stealing fuel and sell it, selling it. And that's just what I heard about, you know. Uh, God only knows, you know, what, what was going on that we didn't hear about. All right, so here's a big one I hear a lot, and it, it's a, a fair question, you know. If our military is so much more capable than the Taliban with tech and weapons and funding, how do we not end up winning the war? How do we get beat by a bunch of guys in the hills with AKs and little equipment? Tactically, we fought the Taliban um, and won almost every skirmish. But like to actually win the war and turn it over successfully, like we probably needed more diplomacy. That's the thing that I would say we probably did poorly is that you have like young American commanders, a second lieutenant who's leading his troops into you know Nangnahar and down in the valleys, and he's the, he, that's your that's your diplomacy. You really need a professional diplomat at engaging at the district, the provincial levels throughout the entire the entire of the country, right? And I, just, I think we kind of did that poorly. What about the people that say we should have stuck it out and that we were too invested already with blood? with wounded and dead and money that we need to, you know, if we leave, all these things will be for nothing. You gotta think like, this is an investment, it, but it is an investment with like American blood. It's also an investment with American, you know, um, ec economically, right? It's an investment there. It's an investment with like uh, American strategy and like that. Like, I, I don't remember the exact number we spent, but it's, I think it was like six trillion or something like that on Afghanistan or GWAT in general to the point at that point in time. And it's like, so if I take X amount of money and I throw it in the stock market, I throw in Bitcoin, right? At what point in time do I pull my losses? You know, and then that's, that's what we're gonna think. Like, yeah, like that doesn't translate exactly by that point in time, but it is an investment. What were we ever gonna get out of Afghanistan? Like from from Germany, we have we still have an ally, right? From Korea, we still have an ally. You know, from like these these wars that our grandfathers fought, like our, and our presence is still there. We have allies. We're never gonna get that in Afghanistan. Mm. Well, thank you guys again for talking to me. Uh, you guys have any closing thoughts before we wrap up? So being at the tactical level of warfare, it's one of those things, I think it weighs heavier on our hearts than it's ever gonna weigh on the heart of hearts of our leaders. It's a politician that sits in Washington who, um, you know, you know, decided on some policy to send X amount of thousands of troops, right? Really at the end, what you've seen was like the tactical level guys, like saving our allies. You see the tactical level guys that it, it it's, it's heavy on our hearts, right? So as, as people like, you know, don't understand like, oh, why shouldn't we been there? Like, I'm not saying you're asking the wrong people because you're probably asking the right people, but what the perspective you're getting is the guys who like, you know, like I was away from my family for, you know, <laughs> you know, years and years to do this. That, that, that's, it's huge, right? Like, you know, like I lost brothers. We lost, like I lost brothers in the Afghan army, you know, like, you know, this and that. I lost brothers in the American army. It's like, like, I get it that you don't understand, but like sometimes it's like, I don't understand either, but like that is as much as you don't understand, that's how heavy it is for me. You know, I'm sure just like anybody else who spent a ton of time, energy, blood, sweat, tears over there, probably, you know, still think a lot about the, the, the people of Afghanistan and what their uh, living conditions are like now. And, you know, heart still weighs heavy for, for the Afghan people quite a bit. There's one Taliban dude over here earlier, I don't know if you saw him. By 2020, the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan became a certainty. The Doha peace talks, COVID-19, and a change in presidential administration all hurried the process along. I saw this personally in my own deployment. When I arrived in Afghanistan in 2019, 
U.S. missions were still happening. Teams and aircraft were supporting Afghan forces, and they were on the offensive. But by March of 2020, the peace talks and pandemic all but eliminated our presence outside the wire. Priorities shifted to shutting down bases and preparing to leave. Without U.S. air support and leadership, Afghan soldiers were left stagnant, waiting for the Taliban to strike. From May to July, the Taliban began taking major footholds across the country where U.S. support was weakest. Then, in the middle of the night on July 2nd, the U.S. suddenly left its most important airfield in Afghanistan, Bagram, unannounced, handing over control to its Afghan partners. By early August, the Taliban was launching full offensives across the country, capturing their first province, Numeraz, followed by five more the same week. With little resistance from the Afghan army, the Taliban laid siege to major population centers like Herat and Kandahar, cornering Kabul. As thousands of U.S. troops were rushed into Kabul's airport to secure the evacuation effort, the Taliban entered the city. Nine days after taking their first provincial capital, the Taliban had seized the entire country. No one predicted that. I'm telling you right now, there's not an analyst alive that predicted it was going that fast. Because like one of the things I heard at the end after the Doha agreement, we were, there were three months, three months, right? Because if you look historically at the Russians, when the Russians left, they left and um, the government held off about 18 months, right? And so corruption happened, the infighting happened and all this, like you're talking weeks. But how did everything fall apart so quickly? We had been training and supplying and fighting alongside the Afghans for years. How did the Taliban get so much momentum so quickly? A lot of that strategic offense came because there's a thing that called it was called Joint Order 125. And so what Joint Order 125 essentially said um, was that all ANSAF forces uh, could, could not conduct offensive operations, okay? So that being said, they had to remain in their checkpoints. At some point in time, they couldn't do offensive operations at 1,000 meters to 800 meters from their checkpoints. And really what that does at that point in time, it allowed the Taliban freedom of movement. And there was very, very little offensive operations going on. And I think that really is kind of what zapped the wheel. What we're really seeing is those low level leaders um, being those checkpoint making deals with the Taliban because they had to for survival. So why do we see so many Afghans throwing down their weapons? Why didn't they try to fight more? What happened was the political leaders leave. The military leaders who had the means to take their helicopters, go up north to Tajikistan and leave, land them in Tajikistan, take off, did the same thing. So that being said, is like you see like these videos in Kabul of leaders, I mean like um, fighters, low-level fighters not wanting to put down their guns on the the Afghan side, right? The Jarroa side, because like, well, Mission command is gone, and so now they're like, hey, I don't want to put down my gun and not fight, but also no one's giving me orders because everyone just left. And that's how, like, it just steamrolled so fast. The last weeks of August 2021 were a perfect storm. Tens of thousands of Afghans and Americans crowded outside the fences of Hkaya, desperate to escape the encroaching Taliban rule. The closing days of the war were violent and chaotic. To get a better understanding of what it was like on the ground in Kabul, I talked to my friend Brennan, an Air Force pararescue man who was there during the entire evacuation. If you'd like to hear our full conversation, you can see it in the link below. Like most of us, I watched the fall of Kabul thousands of miles away on a TV screen. The imagery was surreal. Man, just watching that entire thing go down was tough. Like, seeing guys skydive from C-17 without a parachute because they were trying to get out the country so bad. It's like, well, that's probably one of the toughest images I'll ever, like, see in my life via on the on the news. You know, because it's like, one, has been there, you know, and then, like, you somebody so desperate that, you know, they're trying to get out of the country by holding onto the side of an airplane. Like, Jesus, you know? Of course... You know, everyone's, everyone's probably playing in their mind, you know, if, if I was in charge, if I was, you know, the leader, the president, whatever, uh, you know, what would I have done? And yeah, you know, I don't know. It's like, I think we could have tiered it out, you know, just over whatever period, you know, like, um, and, and, you know, definitely withdrawn at a, a slower rate that could have hopefully 
handled that adjustment period instead of like you know what we saw for sure was more of a, a shock just because it was so quick I, I didn't feel like it would be okay but i also didn't feel like it would happen in a week it was just rushed and we didn't want to leave because we didn't think it was going to happen that fast but we knew it was going to happen that's my take afghanistan is chock full of good and bad as a military, our idealized intentions of what was supposed to happen often didn't line up with the realities of combat on the ground. America made mistakes that cost innocent lives, but the narrative's not that simple. To write us off as complete heroes or total occupying invaders just doesn't capture the whole story. What stood out to me in my research and in my own experience in Afghanistan was just the overwhelming desire from the locals for freedom. On one hand, I got to stand shoulder to shoulder with troops from all over the globe trying to make that reality happen for the Afghan people. But on the other hand, we watched locals and Americans get caught in the crossfire just because we were there. Was that all worth it? The truth is, the war in Afghanistan has no satisfying conclusion. But it did give us two decades of hard-earned experiences. It's up to us as Americans to record and remember those lessons learned so we can avoid mistakes of the past and remember what war requires of us the next time we consider conflict as an option on the table. Maybe then we'll know what to say.